think. Yeah. So welcome everyone for this uh, new CIPTA seminar. So uh, today we are uh, very happy to have uh, Matthias Trofas speaking for us about uh, some quite new things in the realm of imprecise probabilities. <coughs> uh, today we are very happy to have Gerda Kuhlmann as uh, chairman for uh, the talk of Matthias. So without further ado, I hand over the microphone to, uh, to Gerd for introducing uh, Matthias in the talk. Thank you very much, Deb. Um, so I'm going to say a few things about, about Matthias. Um, Matthias was um, one of my earliest PhD students, and he joined our research group in the early 2000s, when research on what we call imprecise probabilities was, was still quite young, and SIPTA wasn't even born yet at that time. So um, his PhD work was focused on, on the mathematical aspects of lower provisions and the relation they have to integration. And so after getting his PhD in 2005, he and I, we continued on ex to, to explore these, these, uh, these issues of, um, of the mathematical aspects of lower provisions. And this effort resulted in a book that was called Lower Provisions, and we published it in 2014. So that's about a decade after he finished his um, his PhD. It took it took a while. And then in in July 2005, Matthias went to Carnegie Mellon University to work with with Teddy Zeidenfeld, who's also present. I see him here uh, looking at me critically. Um, and in in September 2006, after that, after a year, he joined the Department of Mathematical Science at Durham University in England, where he's been climbing through the ranks quickly and where he is currently a full professor. He's the first of my students to actually acquire that status, and that is something very special indeed for me. Now, um, I was talking about lower provisions and the mathematics of that. Now, he's moved on to many, many other things since doing work on those things. He's looked at decision-making, optimization, imprecise Markov chains, issues of temporal coherence, just to name a few of the topics he's been uh, active in. But what is difficult for Matthias is that he moves back and forth with great, great ease between hardcore foundations and hardcore applied stuff. Um, he has no trouble moving from one to the other and back. There is one foundation topic, however, that's continued to intrigue him ever since he went to CMU. And I think that Teddy Seidenfeld must be thanked for infecting him with that virus. It's a benign one, I'm sure. But um, the thing that he's... Um, he's worked on is, is Nelson's REPT or radically elementary probability theory and its non-standard connections with imprecise probabilities. And I believe that this long-standing interest is now bearing fruit and it's doing so generously, as I'm sure we're about to learn this afternoon. So Matthias, I am very keenly looking forward to your talk as I'm sure we all are and you have our undivided and unconditional attention for the coming hour. The floor is yours, Matthias. Th thank you, Herz, for this uh, very, very kind uh, and warm uh, introduction. Um, is that visible? Yeah. All right, fantastic. So indeed, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, some ideas I've, I've, I've been working on for oh, maybe about two years. I've been thinking about this problem, and, and since about a year ago, I started to make some mathematical progress and the idea is really to really think a little bit the foundations around probability and bounded probability so what i'm going to talk about today i think is relevant for this community imprecise probability but i think it's equally relevant for uh, people who do not do bounded probability but just do regular probability theory uh, as i think it helps uh, there as well so my uh, aims are really uh, twofold I, i'm trying to do two things here uh, I'm trying to remove some non-constructive elements uh, that are related to the axiom of choice and the foundations of probability and bounded probability. That's one one overall aim, um, and I'll talk about that, uh, that, that a little bit more later. And the other thing that uh, I want to do is to bring together three uh, seemingly very unrelated theories. So on the one hand, we have Williams' theory of coherent lowest provisions, or williams Wally, if you want. Uh, there is a, a little theory by Lindley, which is largely unknown on the interpretation of probability, which is very simple and elegant and, and uh, very minimalistic that I, that I quite like. And this is very important for applications in risk analysis. And then, as Gert was alluding to, there is a Nelson's radically elementary probability theory, 
uh, and uh, I will somehow unify these three things. Um, that's that's going to be an outcome of me removing these non-constructive elements. Um, I will have some trouble expl uh, explaining Nelson because he used non-standard analysis. So I'm going to use an analogy for that, which doesn't quite do justice to Nelson, but it will give you the intuition. So that's how I will go about things. So I apologize to those people who are hoping to learn more about internal set theory. I'm not going to do that. It's a bit, I felt that was a bit too ambitious for this uh, talk. Anyway, so uh, outlines, I will start with talking about the Finetti and Williams a bit and go to Lindley from there. Uh, then go to Nelson, and then I will give a uh, a new interpretation that's kind of inspired by Lindley, and that brings together uh, uh, Nelson and Williams uh, as well, and then we'll discuss that a little bit. Okay, so that's basically the plan for my uh, talk. So let's start with uh, uh, Definetti, simple Definetti. So I think most people here know this, but some people may not. So let me just go through this. So say that you have the outcome of tossing a fire coin. How could you model your uncertainty around that? So Definetti's idea is to use behavior as a proxy for modeling uncertainty. So uh, you might be, for example, ask yourself, if I promise to pay out uh, $10, um, $10 to you, if the coin lands head, uh, would you pay me f just say under $5? dollars for that or say euros or pounds or whatever you want whatever unit you want to use and then uh, probably you would say yes i would accept that because i ex i expect to get on the long run if i do this many times uh, i might expect to get on average about five yeah about half of the time i will gain five uh, gain ten pounds or ten dollars or ten euros uh, so i should probably be willing to pay anything less than five for that because i will make a profit in the long run Okay, so uh, similarly, if I paid you just over five, would you promise to pay out 10 to me if the coin land heads? And probably you're going to say yes to this as well, uh, because again, because of the, exactly the same reason, uh, because this uh, this will gain you uh, profits in the long run. So um, you could say I have this uh, number. Do you guys see my cursor? By the way, I'm just checking. Yeah, you see this. So um, you might have you have this five and this is kind of a special number for numbers less than five. I'm willing to buy and then I flip over my behavior for larger than five. I sell and at the value five, I don't make a statement, but that's OK. Yeah. So we have this unique number between buying and selling. And that represents kind of the coin being fair. That represents the probability of this coin being a half. That's the idea of Definetti. So it's very useful. You can build probability theory just on this idea. You can just build everything up uh, very nicely. Uh, now there is a, an issue with events that are maybe where you have a bit more uncertainty. So say if I ask, change this question, say consider whether or not it snows in Moscow tomorrow. Now I'm not in Moscow now. I've never been in Moscow. Uh, I've been in St. Petersburg around this time of the year and I know it can get cold and snowy, but it's not quite uh, the same place. But anyway, um, uh, there is yeah, it might snow, but I, I'm not quite, it's not the same like tossing a coin. I'm not quite as certain about my uncertainty about this. Yeah. So um, if I ask the same questions, then uh, would you pay me five minus epsilon if promised to pay you 10 tomorrow, if it snows in Moscow tomorrow, maybe that five is a little bit on the high side. Maybe I should reduce that a bit. And I know that in the winter in Moscow, snow, it probably can happen, right? Uh, <laughs> so maybe I reduce it to about three. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side, if I think about the other transaction, if I paid you five plus epsilon, would you promise to pay me out 10 if it's no in Moscow tomorrow? Then maybe this is a little bit too low. Maybe I will, you, you want me to pay you more and maybe you're really not so sure. And maybe it's like more like nine instead of five. So you have a kind of a different situation here where there is a value three below which you buy and then there's a region where you're undecided and then there's above nine you say yeah at that point I'm willing to sell. So there's this region on, of uh, indecision if you want between this buying and the selling prices. And this is basically the idea of Williams uh, and of many other people of Wally as well and people also some people before Williams. So. 
this idea is that we use the behavior to model also severe uncertainty but by allowing some region of undecidedness uh, between uh, these two prices between the buying the supreme buying price and this infimum uh, selling price okay so that is um that's uh that that's where this all comes from so let's just let me just recap williams's theory because i will use use this uh, later as a reference um so some notation we have a possibility space so that's just um, a set of outcomes of an experiment this can be infinite this can be any any set yeah it's quite arbitrary subset of this uh, possibility space we call events and then uh, p by this calligraphic p i denote the power set just a set of all events yeah but I have then the idea of random quantities i'm going to call them random quantities rather than gambles uh, because they will not in my talk they will not always represent a gamble uh, but these are called the gambles in williams's setting i'll just call them random quantities uh, these are bounded functions yeah so real valued functions on the uh, possibility space we have a set of all random quantities and i can also with events any event i can associate an indicator function that's just a function which is one if the event obtains and zero otherwise okay so far all good so that's my notation uh, we can then do things with that um, the first thing we can do is try to specify bounds of or prices not bounds but prices for random quantities and we can do this in a conditional way and i'll explain in a moment how that interpretation exactly works but the idea is you start with a partial real function so partial function i mean is defined on any subset of the product of um, the random quantities and events so you pick some pairs of random quantities and events any collection of them and that's your domain and then you specify a real number for each of those yeah that's mathematically what a lower provision is that's just a partial function on that uh, space so there's no other structure required of lower provisions at this stage so i don't talk about upper provisions because they're just determined by conjugacy so if you think about buying if you add negation size signs to something you get, you turn it into a selling thing so you can express a buying uh, a buying transaction through a selling transaction and so we don't bother with the upper i will only talk about the lowers but the uppers are obviously implicitly there as well and uh, now comes the uh, interesting thing that's that's what williams did so he understands um he interprets this lower provision so for each random quantity and event in the domain uh this uh lower provision of the random quantity and we denote this uh it's a, um we don't write a comma here we write a, like a bar that's just traditional in probability theory so f given a is the supreme called off buying price for f if a obtains so what does this mean it means that this thing here is desirable and i'm going to give an example uh, just to visualize this a bit because this is hard to understand the first time you see this um so here i've in the blue i've drawn a function so here this real line is just my omega i've drawn a function here and i've drawn an event here in red yeah and if i multiply uh so if i subtract some value alpha I'm going to shift this blue line yeah and these are kind of these green lines uh, but I've gone something extra I multiplied it with the indicator of a what does that really mean it means I set the quantities to zero outside uh, this red event and I've not drawn these zeros here just because they clutter the picture a little bit uh, but basically you just ignore those values that's the idea uh, and then if you think about it for example if you think about this random quantity here the top one is always uh non-negative so obviously you're going to accept that transaction always because it will give you a profit yeah similarly if you look at the one at the bottom is always negative everywhere so you will never accept it and the idea is that at some point so if i draw the dotted lines here as the ones i don't accept at some point my my not accepting changes into accepting and it will happen at a specific value of alpha and here it's at this value of alpha which i think is uh, 0 0.6 i think <laughs> uh, when i made the picture it must have been that's about uh, the value that i think that corresponds to so if if you tr do this exercise of checking different values of alpha you can get to know your the idea is that you can use this to find your 
supreme and buying price. Yeah. So that is uh, that's the idea uh, behind the interpretation of the lower provision. So you translate everything in terms of uh, behavior. Okay. So um, that's for the interpretation. You can do stuff with this. So one thing you can do, for example, is ask yourself. Uh, I may not want to incur a sure loss from accepting these transactions. So here I've got a transaction. Let me maybe draw draw something here. So here, this here is a, is, an, is a desirable transaction by the definition, by the interpretation that's given. So what I've done here, I've just multiplied these transactions with some non-negative uh, numbers. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I have actually made a mistake here. It's not this. I need to also include this thing here yeah these are uh, desirable and then i multiply with with some constants and then i sum yeah and the key thing is i take a finite combination of these i don't think in take infinite combinations of these uh, transactions just a finite combination well then i need that this can never be zero or like this needs to be sorry this needs to be um this needs to be uh, uh negative or zero everywhere uh if this is violated you can show that you will incur a sure loss conditional on the events that are participating in this sum yeah uh, that's the idea um, this notation here maybe i should explain what this means here so this here simply means that lambda is non-negative and uh, lambda is also non-zero yeah that's what this means uh, so you could change this within, with enforcing that the lambdas are all uh, strictly positive everywhere, but for reasons <laughs> I won't go into, it's easier to use this uh, this uh, condition here. Okay, so that's the idea behind uh, the, we call this consistency or avoiding sure loss, but it's not really sure. It's sure conditional on the events that are participating in the sum. Yeah. So that is consistency. And uh, the other thing you can do, you can do natural extension. So again, you can see these desirable transactions that I was drawing in my previous picture uh, appear here. Again, I multiply them. I take sums. Yeah. And then I ask myself, suppose I take any other event B and any other gamble G. If I consider this transaction, and this is larger or equal than this desirable transaction. And obviously this here should also be desirable. This on the left hand side should also be desirable. So that means that alpha here is actually uh, a buying price for G given B. Yeah, for the called off uh, event. Uh, so I can take the supremum of all, all of these. Yeah. And again, I limit myself to uh, uh, finite subset. So again, I have this notation here, which I have not explained, but this notation here means is a finite, sorry, subset of, yeah. So it's like subset, but only finite subsets. Okay. So, uh, I have limits here, but this limit here you can replace that with a soup because I'm taking a limit over an increasing net, um, if you know what that means. But you can just think of it as a supremum if you're not comfortable taking a limit like this. It's called a Moore Smith limit. Um, it's very standard. I mean, there's nothing, there's not, this is a very old thing. But um, you can think of it as a supremum if you're not uh, uh, comfortable with that. Okay, so that's uh, basically the theory of Williams. Now there's some interesting things you can do. What's the relation with like probability theory? I mean, there's no probabilities here, right? So um, there's uh, things you can do with uh, to bring probability back in. There's one theorem I hear uh, I give. It's a duality theorem that uh, um, I proved with the uh, Hertz in my in, in the book. So um, consistency or avoiding sure laws relates to the existence of a finitely additive probability measure on the power set such that uh, the expectation, this is the expectation, sorry, my tablet writing is not so, oops, expectation, let me write it again, expectation, there we go. Uh, so the expectation uh, dominates the lower 
provision. That means I can interpret the lower provision as a lower expectation. Yeah. Uh, and similarly, if we do the natural extension, you just take the lower envelope over all these. So this is a lower envelope over all uh, finitely additive probability measures that are compatible with the initial assessments, lower p. Okay. So this is an unconditional uh, version. There's no conditioning going on here. Uh, so this is not the fully general thing, but you can show that you can uh, completely generalize this, but you need uh, full conditional probability measures. Yeah, you need to do this here. Uh, you need to, um, uh, and this is complicated. Uh, and this is kind of known in the community, but this is, uh, this is not for the, for, this is not easy. And the problem with full condition of probability measures is that they are notoriously complex. There is a representation theorem from Krauss, uh, and I recommend you to read that paper, uh, but it's not so easy. Um, so these hide a lot of structure, these full conditional. The conditions for them are very simple, um, what they need to satisfy, but in order to represent them, it's, it's quite difficult, especially on infinite spaces. Uh, the other issue that um, uh, happens here is that these finitely additive probability measure on the power set, they are intangible. So you can, this is well known, and I think Schechter makes a, makes a very nice discussion of this in his handbook of analysis. Uh, but that means you can't, you can never really explain explicitly write them down yeah there's no you know exact you cannot write down a finitely additive probability measure on the power set of an infinite set it's just not possible you pose they exist and they exist because of the axiom of choice but you cannot write down explicit examples so these are non-constructive things if you want and non-surprisingly the proof for this theorem here um, is non-constructive yeah so this requires um the ultra filter principle or the Hambanach theorem uh, or so, some, some version of the axiom of choice. You can also just use the axiom of choice, uh, but there are slightly weaker conditions that work here too, but it's still non-constructive. So this is especially this uh, full needing full conditional finally out of probability measures. I've always find that a bit uh, of a nuisance and I, I've always wondered why do we need such a lot like hugely complex thing to represent uh, a, a relatively simple idea, especially if you see that the formulas here, these are all fully constructive. Yeah, you don't need uh, this complexity um, here. Um, yeah. So what's going on? Yeah, what's going on with that? And I will try to answer that that and give an alternative uh, for these formulas uh, in full generality later. Okay. So um, yeah. So the, the way I'm gonna do that. Uh, is using very simple finitary objects to, to replace that idea of duality. And this is going to be these Lindley's urns. That's going to be really important. So I'm going to explain that later. So I'll get rid of this full conditional finitely additive probability measures, and I will replace that with urns. But there's a little caveat. I'm going to need nets, and nets are, of course, very powerful things. Uh, so, I mean, you have to have the complexity somewhere. Uh, but it will be hidden away in the net. And inter from an interpretation point of view, I think it's a little bit uh, nicer. So um, this, uh, I'm going to note that this net can be replaced. It's going to be something quite complicated uh, with uh, something in non-standard analysis, but I will not talk about that in this uh, talk. But I just want to highlight that um, because it's, uh, I think it's important. Okay, so uh, from here, let's go back to Linus. I talked that I want to replace these full conditional finitely additive probability measures with a much simpler object. I'm going to now describe this simpler object, and this comes from Lindy's interpretation of probability. So uh, let's go back to this batting, and let's think about a doomsday bat. Yeah, let's take a really like an extreme example. So say that we both believe the world is going to come to an end, to an end uh, next week and we've done our calculations they say an asteroid collision or something like that and uh, this is going to hit us with probability a half yeah say that we've kind of determined this through simulations there's some uncertainty uh, but say we know exactly the probability yeah that's good maybe not realistic but let's just run with that and see what happens so the question is would you pay me now some amount, some positive amount, if I promise to pay you out 10 pounds uh, or 10 euros or dollars uh, in one week, if indeed this event happens. 
Um, and of course you would not. Yeah, you're not gonna pay me now because when this event happens, it's kaboom. Um, you cannot execute this this gamble. Similarly, if I paid you now five plus epsilon, would you promise to pay me ten uh, in one week? Oh yeah, yeah, for any amount. Uh, please, please, you know, give me money. <laughs> I mean, let me give you money and you'll be very happy to accept any money, right? Because, and again, you're never going to be able to pay that £10 uh, back. So um, you're always going to sell, in other words. Although the probability is a half. And of course, that's because of the interpretation. This is an extreme example. Uh, but um, this has bothered people in risk analysis and, and they can't in situations like this where the 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 batter or the decision maker themselves is at risk in some way uh you can't really use batting as a as a it's not a proper analogy for uncertainty for that reason and lindley and avon uh, and other researchers have, have discussed this uh, i think also hayek in his uh, in the Sta stanford encyclopedia of probability also talks about this so this is kind of a well-known thing but it is a problem for the theory of lower provision because we typically uh, use batting. So um, there's another model here that Lindy proposed. This is not very well known. It's been hidden away in his book. I don't think many people are very aware of this, uh, but uh, the idea is very simple. You think of each outcome in your possibility space as a color and uh, omega does not need to be finite. So you can have an infinite number of colors in principle. However, uh, you will pick uh, a finite collection of colored balls with colors from omega so that will of course be a finite collection of colors in the end um and you consider you take that urn and you consider that as a standard for your uncertainty about omega yeah and I'll, I'll give some examples in a bit to clarify this but basically the proportions of the balls in the urn represent your in a way the probabilities about the event that's going to happen so you specify the urn and then you declare in a way that your uncertainty about the color from one ball uniformly drawn from the urn is equivalent to your uncertainty about the state of the world about omega yeah and uh, again you draw the ball uniformly so only proportions matter it doesn't matter how many balls you have in this urn as long as the proportions are the same uh, it re it's the same representation okay so that's the idea um so just give some examples so for example for the um uh head tails example with a coin you have exact half probability of one or the other way so my uncertainty about the outcome of the coin is equivalent for example to this urn with uh, 18 balls nine of which are red and nine of which are blue yeah but i could have w one red ball and one blue ball it would also be fine uh but it doesn't have to be yeah anything like this doomsday or no doomsday scenario is there's no problem to present that if i say probability half i think that i could say well i'm just going to represent this as an urn with four red balls and four blue balls yeah um easy peasy or say i have a match a football match or something i have win draw lose outcomes i could represent it again by an urn and that urn is the representation of my uh, uncertainty and this is very appealing i think because very intuitive to explain it's kind of very simplistic like i mean you can't really reduce probability much more than this uh whilst still keeping some level of generality yeah uh so i, I think this is quite nice it's not very well known but it's quite nice uh model so uh some mathematical notation now so an urn is just going to be a function just of omega so there's no conditioning going on here you just have an unconditional uh probability mass function if you like and it's rational valued yeah and it has finite support of course uh because otherwise it can't represent and earn a finite number of balls yeah so uh so we just use the proportions directly to represent the urn um so you can of course uh, calculate proportions from this you can calculate conditional proportion of colors uh you can also calculate averages and conditional averages so i'm going to explain how this works so this this give like expectation operators if you like and i will use this notation a lot so it's quite important but it basically works as follows suppose i again uh, look at this uh, urn here win draw lose suppose i have a random quantity f that gives two to win 
uh, zero to draw and minus three to lose. So what I will do, I will assign two to the green balls. So I've labeled these here with two. I assign zero to the draw ball, so to the blue balls. Okay, so you have to put zeros there. Minus three to the red balls. And then I just can calculate the average value. Yeah, and that's an expectation operator. Turns out that's an expectation operator, uh, but it's just an average. It's a physical average. Yeah, so there's no probability going on here, if you like. It's just a physical average. It's a property of the urn uh, that I'm uh, just describing. Yeah, and you can do this in a called off way. You can just condition this on an event. That means, for example, if I condition this on, uh, say, draw and lose, that means I would just remove, the, I would not consider green balls here. And I can do that. Okay. So that's the kind of things I can do. And uh, of course, all the rules of probability, they just follow from, from this without any extra work. So this is, I think, why, why linear devices this is a very simple interpretation and it immediately gives you all the rules of inference that you want. Yeah, there's some downsides, of course, but it's, it's kind of gives you everything kind of for free. Um, uh, something that you need to be aware of is that this is based on introspection. So there's an introspective method of representing your uncertainty. So it's not experimentally verifiable like the betting interpretation. Um, and this is actually something that you want in risk analysis uh, because this, this experimental verification with betting kind of interferes with the interpretation itself. Yeah. So using behavior as a proxy for beliefs has downsides and and in some situations these downsides are so overwhelming that you just can't do it as i given in this doomsday example so um you can still use this as a basis for decision making of course uh no problem no nothing that stops you from doing that um it is um practically some downsides it's practically limited to finite omega yeah you have finite number of balls so what are you going to do with, uh, with with more complex things? You only have rational values, probabilities. So something like the normal distribution, mm, sorry, uh, can't do it. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, so that is obviously a downside. Uh, you can't condition on events that uh, have zero probability, so to speak, for of events that uh, have no support. Um, so you don't really have full conditional probabilities either uh, although you can condition on some events but not all of them and of course it's hard to specify this urn when you have severe uncertainty so the questions can be used bounding now lindy was very much opposed to using bounding i must say this he he did not like that idea and he discusses this also in the context of this uh, uh interpretation but um uh, we're gonna we're gonna do it anyway okay so we're... so what i want to do is solve these last three last four problems yeah and uh, I'm going to already give you uh, 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 kind of uh, the, 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 the the big result is that we're going to solve this and we're going to recover Williams completely. That sounds a little bit insane that you can do this just with urns, but um, it, it is, that's what happens. I actually set out to prove that you could not recover Williams, but I found that I <laughs> recovered it completely. So um, it's kind of, a, it was an interesting journey. Um, all right. So... Um, now I come to the last uh, name and that's Nelson. So for Nelson, I need to start with a big disclaimer. So I'm gonna try to explain the intuition behind it or some intuition, uh, and I'm gonna use gnats. Now, if you read Nelson's work, there are no gnats anywhere, yeah? So I'm reinterpreting Nelson in a kind of incorrect way. Oh. So, um, so I'm, not going to do full justice to the Nelson internal set theory uh, approach. I'm just having a subjective and reinterpretation of his non-standard analysis using just objects from standard analysis. And my choice of object is a net. Um, and why do I do this? Why don't I just give Nelson like it is? Uh, I think most people are unfamiliar with non-standard analysis, and I just don't think it, uh, it would be... Uh, productive to, to do this uh, in the short time that we have. And the other reason is actually nets are going to be really important later. So, yeah. Um, so it kind of kind of fit, fits these two purposes. So I'm going to start um, with uh, an example. This is a really fun example. And actually, I discussed this with some of my uh, probability colleagues uh, uh, last week <laughs> to get their thoughts on this. Um, so consider 
binomial yeah sampling from binomial distribution yeah very very simple this is like the simplest thing with probability half okay you can't imagine anything simpler so i'm going to define uh y n as x n squared minus n squared over 2 over n over 2 so what i basically have done i've take x n squared so i'm just moving in in steps of n squared so i'll look at x1 uh, x2, x4, and so on, x9. Um, and then uh, what you notice that the expectation is zero, the variance is one, so this is basically normalized. Uh, this is a scaled version of the original that has zero, mean, and variance one. Yeah. Uh, I also note that this random variable obviously only has rational values. It doesn't take any other values except rational ones. So in other words, for every n, I have that probability of y n, the probability that it's rational, is one yeah so here's the question what does probability theory say about the limits of these random variables yeah and um the um huh. if you ask this to oh, people not extremely well trained in probability but having some knowledge of probability so if you ask this to a uh say a first year undergraduate who's had a course on probability you say oh yeah i know what this is this is a normal distribution yeah, because of the central limit theorem, and they're going to be very happy they know the central limit theorem, they're going to be very excited. Uh, the truth is, probability theory actually says nothing about this limiting random variable. Uh, and there is a, in fact, it does not exist in a way. Um, at least not if you use a certain interpretation of limits. So, say you use just pointwise convergence, so weak star convergence of probability. So he's just going to say the distribution of this limiting variable is just a limit of the of the distributions of the uh, of the distributions in the, in the sequence. Yeah. So then this <laughs> then it follows that this limit cannot have a sigma additive distribution on the Borel sigma field. Yeah. So that's bad. So basically it means that this is not even a random variable. Uh, and the reason is that, of course, for each individual point, the probability is going to converge to zero. You can easily show that. Uh, but of course, the limit of the, pro the random variable belonging to the rationals is going to be one. So this here is going to be one. So this is not compatible because the rationals are countable. This is not compatible with sigma additivity. So that is, um, I think, disturbing. Yeah, I mean, I find that a little bit disturbing. So in probability theory, they also find this a little bit disturbing and they have the following solution for this. Instead of talking about the limit under weak star convergence, they talk about convergence in distribution. Yeah, so this is, this is kind of uh, the key thing. So what does that mean? It basically says they can only say things about these events. Yeah, in the limit, yeah. Uh, this is sometimes also called weak convergence. Uh, this is very confusing terminology, but this is sometimes also called weak convergence. Um, now, uh, that is, of course, one solution. Now, I want to go to Nelson because Nelson has something really interesting to say about this. And again, I'm doing Nelson reinterpreted. I'm not doing Nelson uh, rigorously here. But this um, sequence here of probability distributions so i um has a weak star converging subsequence to a finitely additive additive probability measure on the entire power set yeah so i can take so here this limit i can take this but sometimes it may happen that this limit does not always exist so for the rationals of course it does exist it's not a problem but there are certain events where this limit may not exist uh but still we can solve this by taking a converging subsequence yeah, and now guess what? How do I pick the subsequence? I need the axiom of choice to do this. Uh, so that is uh, quite quite interesting, isn't it? So Nelson really uh, is happy. So standard probability theory does not answer this bottom question. Yeah, I cannot say anything about this limit in general. There may be certain constructions where I can, but in general I can't. Uh, but Nelson says you can always do it. Uh, but um, you need to pick a weak star converging subsequence. That's not actually what he says. It says something very, very different from what I'm saying here, but that's kind of my interpretation of uh, his, uh, his statements. So, um, so 
in this interpretation of Nelson's theory, if I want and want to avoid non-standards, one way to look at Nelson is that he says represent all of probability theory this way, not just uh, uh, the central limit theorem, but just use weak star converging nets of probability mass functions. It earns, okay, probability mass earns are rational values and probability mass functions are real valued. That's kind of a technical detail uh, that I'm going to gloss over, but um, uh, really that's, that's, that's what he says. In a way, you can interpret Nelson in this, this manner if you want, uh, though Nelson's uh, work is, is uh, both simpler and more complex. Uh, but if you, if you just stay, if we take, just run with this idea that this is what Nelson does, although he doesn't, but if you, if you think this as an, uh, an, an adequate analogy, then consequence is the normal distribution is not unique. Yeah, you may have many different converging subsequences uh, that, um, that are appropriate for the central limit theorem. And this ambiguity is in fact an essential part of his theory. So he uses something called infinitesimals and you can never measure or specify exactly what an infinitesimal is. Uh, and that always remains as a kind of an ambiguous parameter in all your calculations. And then hopefully this, this the, in the end, in your final calculation, the actual, this doesn't matter. And that's the inferences that you're interested in, but it's kind of an essential part of his theory, which is, uh, uh, not often pointed out, but that's, that's, that's how you can say it. Also for Nelson, normal distributions are allowed to be finitely additive, even on the Borel Sigma field. There's no problem for him. And he has a central limit theorem that allows for finite additivity, uh, completely. Uh, it is non-constructive, I should say. So you have this converging subsequence. Um, so Nelson solved this by using another kind of non-constructive axiom that plays the similar role to the ultrafilter sim principle, uh, but it's kind of quite intuitive, I would say. Um, and then his central limit theorem does not rely on sigma additivity. That's also something I want to point out. Uh, this is kind of known, I think, in this community and maybe in, in other communities as well. But Schaefer and Wolf, for example, have a proof of the central limit theorem that does not rely on sigma additivity. So, uh, and there, there may be other communities where this is known, but Nelson did this in the in the 80s uh, so that predates that work for quite a bit and i think the it's also far more general than what schaefer and wolfk uh, do so um some thoughts um instead of weak star converging nets you could instead take arbitrary nets and just take a limb in from a limb soup yeah the benefit of doing that everything becomes completely constructive yeah you don't need to choose a converging subnet um so much simpler. The other thought I have, if I look at this, maybe we should rephrase the central limit theorem as a bounding statement about that limiting distribution. Um, yeah, that's just a thought. And I think that's effectively what Schaefer and Wolfk, for example, uh, essentially do. Uh, but um, uh, I think in probability theory, if you look, talk to probabilists, they will not think of it as a bounding statement. But maybe that's a useful thing to do. Maybe that should change. And maybe even finite additivity as part of the um, central limit theorem should be okay. I mean, I've given you a very simple example uh, where, where it just happens. Yeah. I mean, you can't get much simpler than this. Uh, and finite additivity just pops out. And it's not really a problem, I think, um, uh, for inferences. Your inferences remain completely valid as long as you uh, think about, uh, for example, as long as you think about continuous bounded functions, this is totally fine. Yeah, okay. So anyway, that's some questions uh, here. Um, so what I want to do now is uh, move on to the main part of my time. I'm sorry, I, uh, uh, we're already talking for quite a bit, but I want to go on to the main part here and give you the... Um, kind of unification of all of these uh, ideas. So um, I'm going to start with, like Williams, I'm going to start with some function that describes some bounds. Um, okay, but I'm not going to interpret this lower provision through batting. Uh, instead, I'm going to do something else. So um, I'm going to fix an epsilon, which allows me to make an approximate statement. And I'm also going to fix a finite subset. So remember this special notation here. This means finite subset of the domain. Um, I'm going to say that my urn that represents my uncertainty is such that for every, uh, sorry, for every FA, so for every quantity and event, uh, every pair that is in my, uh, dom in my subset of the domain that I've chosen, my urn is such that 
um, for all of these, my probability is strictly positive. That's by the urn. So there's at least one ball in the urn with a color from A. And additionally, um, the conditional expectation from my urn, and, the, and this is defined because this is strictly positive, of course, is bounded by my lower provision up to epsilon. Yeah, so I'm allowed. I'm allowing myself a little bit of a wiggle room, uh, and uh, that that's kind of necessary. Without that, this theory does not work. So, in other words, it represents a lower bound on the subject's urn average up to epsilon, and uh, this urn is allowed to depend on the choice of epsilon and the finite subset of the domain. So, the finite subset can be as large as you want, arbitrarily large, uh, but um, uh, but it must be finite. Yeah, and I'm going to back, go back a little bit to Williams, because in Williams this also occurs. So this idea of finite subsets, I'm going to just emphasize this. Yeah, we had this here in the natural extension. Yeah, uh, this appeared there as well. Uh, we had this here also in the consistency. Yeah, in the consistency requirement, we also looked at finite subsets. So this is not something very strange i would say if you are familiar with williams already this is not the strangest thing to do um so let me it corresponds to the idea of only taking finite sums uh that's that's what i want to say so from there you can just talk about a creedal set here uh if you think about it so a creedal set that i can associate with uh, my lower provision in terms of urns now is just any urn that satisfied this this condition here yeah uh, and you just can consider a collection of all of these. And these are approximate, of course, they're relative to my choice of epsilon and my choice of k, my finite subset of the domain. Yeah. So now I have a, a really, a net, this determines a net of creedal sets uh, because this, this index here, you can interpret this as a directed set. So it kind of functions as a sequence or a generalized sequence uh, of uh, uh, creedal sets. So uh, what can we do with this uh, next? So we can look at consistency. So consistency is of course requiring that this set is non-empty, yeah, for all epsilon and all k. Uh, and this ID generalizes, uh, what do you mean by q is never fully satisfied? Do you mean never fully specified? Yeah, I, I so yeah, Lindley will say, fix your q yeah but that's not what i'm doing i'm just saying my urn q i have some bounds on it i never directly specify it i just specify some bounds on it so i only ever really specify these approximate creedal sets for different values of epsilon and k yeah um and these sets will rarely be singletons um i guess they could they be maybe they could be uh, but I don't think so um, for any so I, I think you can show that this is never a singleton. Um, they will eventually, conver they may converge to kind of a singleton in a certain sense, but uh, they will never be singletons. Okay, so that's a difference from Lindley. Um, I hope that answers the question. Uh, if not, we can discuss it afterwards. So uh, to get to Nelson, so Nelson talks about nets. So you can show that this is equivalent. Very easy. There's a very easy equivalence that you can show. This is not difficult, but you can show this is the same as saying there is a net of urns such that uh, my lower provision is dominated by the limit over this net. So remember what I said about uh, constructive, making the theory constructive and replacing the limb with a limb inf and a limb soup. That's exactly what's going on here. So I could replace this with there exists a converging net of urns so that the limit dominates the uh, lower provision. But that would make this non-constructive. To prove this, I need the axiom of choice or the ultra filter principle or something, something similar. So, um, so by taking the limit, I've sidestepped this non-constructiveness in the theory completely. Yeah, so that's quite nice. And I know the kind of shocker statement and the thing that is actually quite, uh, uh, it's not the hardest thing that, uh, to prove, but it's not, it's not quite obvious to prove this. And the reason is because of these strict inequalities here and also because of this inequality here, um, the standard duality results um, can't be used and you need to use versions of Farkas lemma uh, to to get to it 
Um, and um, this is equivalent to Williams avoiding Shore loss. So this formula on the bottom is the one I have shown already. This is Williams avoiding Shore loss. So it's completely equivalent. So the cons notion of consistency that you get from this interpretation is completely the same as the notion of consistency you get through batting, which I think is quite nice. Uh, and for me, very surprising when I first uh, uh, found this. Um, okay, so um, let me move on to the idea of inference. So inference, how would you do inference from this model? So again, I can take a lower expectation or a lower average, if you like, by looking at these creedal sets and then just taking infimum over them. And again, I need to have this condition here to make sure that this thing is well defined. And then I can take a limit. This limit is just a supremum. Yeah, this you can show this is an increasing uh, net. Uh, so this limit is in fact, uh, you can just think of it as a supremum. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that's also uh, quite nice. Yeah. So, um, uh, and again, what can you show, and this is hard, okay, this proof is really not easy, but what you can show uh, is that this is completely the same as Williams' natural extension. So this is, this is formally here, this is just Williams. Yeah, you get the same thing. Uh, but all I needed is urns and some infima and a limit. So that's, yeah, that's kind of shocking. Uh, so I, I don't need full, I have a, a lower envelope theorem in terms of probabilities, well, urns, yeah? So I have a direct link with like a simple probability version of probability theory, but I don't need full conditional uh, probability measures to do this, uh, which is uh, kind of amazing. So because I know full conditional probability measures have these zero layers and a very complicated structure, and this is all somehow encoded in this. So that is quite uh, quite nice. Um, so let me end with a few corollaries, uh, and I'm almost end of my presentation, no worries. Um, so if we assume it's consistent, and actually I can always approximate the natural extension using a finite subset of urns. So I can always find a finite subset of urns to approximate my natural extension relative to some finite domain. So I'm looking at the, the, the natural extension here on this finite domain, yeah? So I'm only looking at GB in this finite domain, but as long as I'm only interested in a finite number of random variables uh, and uh, 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 events, uh, I can always represent my natural extension using a finite set. And this set satisfies this here, this condition, this very interesting condition that the lower probability is strictly positive. And this is interesting because this means that this is fully defined through like natural extension. Natural extension is very easy. If the lower probability becomes zero, then the natural extension becomes vacuous. This is a well-known problem in, uh, uh, in uh, imprecise probability theory. So uh, in particular, it means I can appro always approximate my regular extension. We try to solve this uh, through natural extension. So that's kind of interesting that you can just impose this condition like that. And the surprising thing is this proof, I mean, it takes a little bit effort from this result. You basically use this result and it takes a little bit of effort. It's not entirely immediate, but it's fairly immediate. And it does not use krein milman which is again, a non-constructive uh, <laughs> uh, element in the, in the theory. So I've also removed that use of the krein milman uh, extreme point representation theorem you don't need that, strictly speaking, uh, in this uh, this version of the theory. So uh, I also mention a variation of Krauss's representation theorem, which goes through zero layers and a very nice paper, but it's very complicated. So I, it also follows immediately, almost immediately from this, from uh, this these results that every full conditional finitely additive probability measure you can represent it by a single non-standard probability mass function with finite support. In the fact a single non-standard rational valued probability mass function to find a support. So that goes even beyond uh, what Krauss says. So this does not use zero layers, this proof. So you can prove this without touching zero layers. You use just that to do it. Uh, and that is, um, yeah, that's, that's quite nice. Okay, so let me uh, just briefly discuss it. So we have a new interpretation for lower provisions, so a supremum lower average, if you like. Um, we use rational valued probability mass functions with finite support, and this works for high risk situations. And I think the main 
benefit of this is that this is kind of easier to understand and betting to some audiences. So I guess that's the, that's the will be the main attraction. Um, we have some new formulas uh, and they are completely constructive. Yeah, there is a new duality theorem for conditional low provisions, which is uh, maybe subjectively simpler. Um, but you use nets uh, to do it, and uh, you don't need these finitely additive uh, full conditional probability measures. Yeah, uh, we've unified Williams, Lindley, and Nelson in this way in a very uh, cool way. Uh, this last result here, what I this quality of Krauss's representation theorem, this really shows because uh, Nelson will use non standard probability mass function with finite support in his theory. That's what he basically argues for. It shows it's completely general. Yeah, it shows that Nelson's elementary probability theory can capture all of probability theory. Yeah, just everything. Uh, and that is quite nice, even for conditioning. Yeah, for unconditional case, I think this is kind of known, but for the unconditional case, this works as well. And uh, as I said, it's fully constructive. So uh, let me conclude. So for boundless probability, we have an interpretation that does not need batting, and we can do duality without uh, these uh, full conditional probability measures. I think those are the main messages. Uh, but for generally for probability theory, I think there's also some important messages here. Uh, finite additivity, I think, helps with limits. Yeah, If you embrace finite additivity, you sidestep some of the issues you have uh, otherwise. Uh, bounding is interesting still. If you do, Even if you do just a regular probability theory, if you want to be constructive, um, try to use limbs and limb soups and that, that that helps with that if you don't want choice um i think every probably should look at nelson's work uh, i also ask yeah is measure theory is that an unnecessary part of the foundation of probability so that's definitely what nelson says that's his main message uh, and i think he's i think he's right uh the other thing if you look at these examples is sigma additive actually hindering probability theory by insisting that the normal distribution needs to have some sigma additive measure associated with it you're excluding very natural and normal uh, limits to, to, to occur. Yeah, you can't talk about limiting variables. Uh, so maybe we need to rethink scaling limits generally uh, uh, as bounding statements. Maybe that's a useful uh, endeavor just to rethink that. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I'm happy to uh, uh, answer any questions that have been asked that I haven't answered yet or take any other questions. Thank you so much.